you've mentioned a bunch of the stuff that the Jurassic Park series mm. gets wrong. Uh, maybe you could speak to more things, but also what does it get right? So a, a lot of like very, in some level, generic, but quite important things it gets right. T-Rex is about the right size and shape and is massive. And you don't actually see it run. You see it power walk. If you watch the Jeep chase again, you'll see it only ever has one foot on the ground. <laughs> the weird thing for me is how much some of them vary. So like, I'm a big pterosaur guy. I do lots of work on pterosaurs, the flying reptiles. The pteranodons in Jurassic Park 2, The Lost World, you see them very, very briefly in one of the last shots. And they're okay, but they're not great but it's clearly a bit of a throwaway shot. The ones in Jurassic Park 3, I think, are mostly excellent. Really, really good. And then the ones in Jurassic World are terrible. Like a massive regression. There's loads and loads of details that are right in JP3 that are completely wrong in Jurassic World. And you're like, why did you take a really good model and make it much, much worse and less accurate? I don't understand. Um, and I, again, it's fiction. At one level, who cares? But like, as as you said, like, I, I don't think, so see, the weird thing for me is I don't think it would affect how they're perceived by the public. I, some things I get, like, for example, in Jurassic World, the pteranodons pick people up with their feet and fly off with them. Pteranodons feet don't work like that. It would never be able to do that. And it would never have the lift. But I get for dramatic purposes, you might want to show that, okay, fine, you know, this is your big sequence, you need that. But for the rest of the animal, it's weirdly inaccurate. And I don't think the public would know, and they might well care, if it was much more accurate. And I don't think it would be any harder to make it accurate than to make it inaccurate. Um, I've spoken to a colleague of mine, who I won't name just in case I get him into trouble, um, <laughs> who's a big dinosaur nerd, but also a big creature creator and designer and has done a whole bunch of proper Hollywood A-list movie stuff. And I asked him about this and I went, okay, but like, is it just easier to take the model that you've got and mess around with it than to, if I came in and said, you need to fix that, you need to fix this, you need to fix this, you need to fix that. And he basically went, no, nah, it's about the same amount of effort. It's not like we don't have the director or the producer or the lead designer going, no, I want that arm a bit longer. I want that tail a bit brighter. Can you add a few more bits there? I don't like those scales. So he said, we're doing that constantly anyway. So doing it to one set of design specs versus another set of design specs is no more hassle. In other words, he said, it's no harder to make it accurate than to make it inaccurate. And it's like, if that's truly the case, then just make it right. And then you can claim a level of accuracy and engagement that you can. I mean, it's interesting. There's the, there's a thing called the Jurassic Foundation. After the first Jurassic Park, made an absolute fortune. Spiel, I think it was Spielberg directly, maybe being through Universal. But anyway, they set up the Jurassic Foundation, and it's a small fund of money for research on dinosaurs and related animals. And academics can apply for it. My PhD, one of my PhD students, got some money from the Jurassic Foundation. Like that's great. He didn't have to do that. He went. Paleontology's helped give me this. I'm going to give back a bit. And after what must be what, 30 years now, it's probably funded an awful lot of research and helped young researchers get a start. So there's a level of engagement there that I think hasn't been in subsequent films, which you can kind of see for once it goes from being a one-off to being a franchise and it's changed hands. I mean, how many different directors has it had now? you know Spielberg did the first two and then done about the next five must be two if not another three more people uh you know and 30 years later it, it's it's all changing yeah but that's the path of creating a legendary film it's yeah the, the depth of accuracy and it's not that difficult to work but it's also it does something to the to the whole artistic creation if you create a culture of where the details really really matter, matter. yeah and, it, and and again there's there's some oddities so like Gallimimus, I mentioned it earlier, so one of the ornithomimosaurs, the model for Gallimimus in Jurassic World is nearly identical to that from Jurassic Park. One of the differences, which you can barely see on film, but I know this is true because I found it in like Jurassic World kids' book because I flicked through it when it came out. It's a close-up of the head with an arrow to the teeth. Gallimimus doesn't have teeth. It's got a beak. So someone has taken the original model and actively spent time adding teeth to an animal that didn't have them. 
I would understand it. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I'd understand if it, if it was a rule of cool and like, yeah, but it would look so much better with all these gnarly big teeth and whatever. And it's like, you can't even see it in the final thing. They've got tiny little heads. In the film, all they do is like run past the camera briefly. It's not like they're a big carnivore and they're engaged in like one of the big battles. Like, why? Why? <laughs> it's not like, you can't even barely see them. Uh, well, yeah, again, just to linger on it, there is a lot of value to authenticity in all walks of life. And one of them yeah. is accuracy. When you're talking about dinosaurs, it's so valuable and so worthy and it's respectable for the long life of a film to be accurate. I just wish, I, I hope they do that. There's certain directors that really dogmatically push that. Alex Garland comes to mind. You know, he, he did whenever he integrates like quantum computing or mm. AI into a film. Nolan with the black hole in Interstellar, where they yeah. ended up publishing a paper on the calculation to visualize I mean, that's that. legendary. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's exactly. Really, and like, you think that has nothing to do with the story, the narrative of the film, but it does. It like permeates everything. If you get that black hole right, that yeah. everybody else steps up their game and really really tells a story in this way that reverberates through time and every, it like really moves people so yeah I, I yeah i mean as i say i i i wish it was better i mean the the only thing i'd i'd flip it around it's a joke i've made more than once but like just just don't take it as a documentary no one wants watches james bond and goes that's how international espionage works <laughs> you know he's got the laser watch and the exploding car and it's like may, maybe treat it a bit as fiction i i i've heard from a friend of mine who worked at uh, the royal terrell museum which I, I mentioned before in in alberta which is an absolute phenomenal place um and she said after the first one genuinely like it was not common but more than once people were annoyed that they didn't have the real dinosaurs out back because they'd seen them and they knew that the real ones were out there which is a testament to industrial light and magic and Stan Winston, but also wow. slightly horrifying <laughs> that anyone watched Jurassic Park and literally thought that music. Also, why do you go to a museum? You go to the zoo if it's alive. There you will also meet, uh, what is it, King Kong and Godzilla. Yeah, yeah. 